Welcome to the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast, where you'll discover new opportunities to grow your business from seven figures to eight from the world's most successful agency and B2B SaaS executives. I'm your host, Corey Quinn. Let's jump into the show. Today, I'm joined by the amazing Bill Hauser. Welcome, Bill. I'm excited about this, Corey. I'm excited that you're here too, my friend. Could you share a little bit about uh, yourself, your background, and what SMB Team is and what you guys do? Yep. So SMB Team is a law firm growth acceleration company, and the services that we offer are law firm transformation services. So we basically provide every service that's required to double a law firm owner's revenues, profits, or freedom. Hopefully all three of them at the same time is is usually our goal. And the way that we do that is through disruptive digital marketing, which includes a very nuanced approach to social media that nobody else is doing in the industry uh, with a very efficient approach to PPC and SEO that focuses on Uh, the 80-20 rule, the 20% of inputs that produce 80% of the outputs in a very competitive market such as legal. So that's kind of the marketing bucket. So we have a over eight figure part of our business that just does marketing services. And then we also have another part of our business that does over eight figures, which is coaching law firm owners through fractional CFO services, marketing coaching, law firm management coaching, and a seven figure attorney mastermind. So that's kind of like the coaching bucket. And then we have a virtual assistant company that's about to break eight figures in the next few months. And that's where we answer lawyers' phone calls. So we do their sales follow-up, we answer all their inbound leads, and we set up lawyers with full-time virtual assistants that work in their firm full-time. And then we also help law firm owners with, you know, the list just keeps going on and on. I love this. This is amazing. We also uh, are (laughs) launching a very impactful recruiting solution uh, that's kind of been a little hush hush, but it's you know working on in the background. And the whole world premiere. You've heard it here, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time. First time. All right. But the whole ethos here is to (laughs) the whole ethos is we want to provide small business owners such as lawyers access to the solutions that they otherwise would have a really painful time trying to find on their own. We want to be that trusted brand where they can just sign up with us to basically grow their business. Okay. There's so much here to unpack, but let me just kind of feed feed this back to you. You have multiple eight-figure businesses, including digital marketing agency services, which you talked about, the coaching services, the virtual assistants, and you're launching other businesses. This is all specifically targeting one vertical market, which are attorneys. Is that correct? Yep. Yep, That's awesome. What is your role there as the CEO? What's your day-to-day look like? Yeah. So it's a constant process of discovery. So I think that's part of the reason that I I spend, you know, over $600,000 a year on coaches and mentors. That's, that's my annual budget for that is because being in a CEO role, no one's managing you. And so it's really hard to know where you should invest your time. So I invest a lot of time and money in trying to learn where is the intersection of my skills with where I can create the greatest contribution to the business and trying to find that intersection as much as possible. And that's changed almost every three months. I'd I'd say that my role has completely changed. And so I would say, to answer your question, my role is to be the most nimble in the company and to adjust to, to what's needed. And the three buckets that I invest my time within that adjustment frame is strategic thinking, vision setting, and impactful communication, right? So I, these are my three personal focuses as CEO. So strategic thinking is coming up with the next decisions that are gonna advance the business, especially the, the needle moving decisions and also the ones that we're gonna say no to. So that's strategic thinking. Vision setting is making sure everyone's excited about where we're going. So how do we do that through our culture? How do we do that through our recurring meetings? How do we do that through our executive team so that they're sharing the gospel in addition to me? So that's vision setting. And then also setting quarterly goals falls within vision setting, making sure we're approaching the right targets, we're attacking the right targets every quarter and adjusting every quarter. 
And then the third bucket is impactful communication. So some CEOs are more introverted and, and impactful communication is something they shouldn't invest as much time as I do on it, but I'm a very, I, I would say public facing in terms of our marketing. So I, I invest a lot of time impactful communication for our clients, for our prospects, and for our team. So if, if Bill is doing those three things, people are usually happy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig, I love all that. Let's dig into a little bit about the origin story of SMB team. I know you have a, before this, you were at YP as a sales rep. You were doing some other things at Chubb and elsewhere before then. What sort of, what's a good place to pick up for, for this origin story for SMB team? Wow. Yeah, I think... Michael Gerber, who I've, I've had the honor of interviewing three times, the author of E-Myth, he is like probably one of the entrepreneurial thinkers who worded this best. It's called the, the entrepreneurial seizure the, or the, the technician seizure, where you basically think because you're good at a skill, you should go start a business around that skill. And running a business around that skill is a very different skill set than doing the skill itself. So for example, someone who's good at painting, they go, I'm gonna have an entrepreneurial seizure and start a painting company, right? And the wake up call, the reason that 90% of businesses have less than one employee is artists, it's very hard for an artist to become, uh, learn the skills of becoming an executive, a business owner and an entrepreneur. But for me, my, my initial skill was sales and digital marketing. And when I was at yellowpages.com, I was able to sell their high level digital marketing solutions. And then, you know, that was a perfect mix of my skills, selling digital marketing solutions. And after I got to around 18 months at that job, became a top salesperson there, number one in net business. It was a flood of negative emotion. And it was the first time in my life I experienced the concept success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure, right? I had external success, but I didn't have any fulfillment in my soul. I felt I didn't believe what I was representing. I didn't believe in the product. I didn't believe in really anything I was doing. I just wanted to win. That's it. I'll never forget the day they first rolled out the leaderboard, the sales leaderboard on the East Coast. And my entire life changed the day I saw that leaderboard. I grew up racing dirt bikes. So I'm super competitive. It's an individualistic sport, uh, racing dirt yeah. bikes. Like you just want to beat everyone else. And yeah. when I saw that in sales, it triggered the old competitor in me from dirt bikes. And I was just like, I'm just going to win. I will be number one, no matter what. And it just triggered this irrational obsession around learning everything I could around digital marketing and sales. When I came to this breaking point, 18 months after actually winning, I realized I wanted to keep doing digital marketing and sales, but I wanted to control the quality of the product, right? So that was really what caused me to quit. I also think there's an element of DNA like that a lot of people are unaccepting of. Like for some odd reason, it was really hard for me to work for someone else. I mean, my, my first day on my sales job, I basically told my sales manager, you need to get the hell out of my way and let me perform like, or I'll just go leave and start my own business. And he did. And he made a lot of money because he let me do sales my own way. <laughs> but I just knew from the start, I wasn't going to be a, I wasn't going to be a, you know, an employee. So long story short, I start the agency and I was actually selling to contractors and, um, okay. That's interesting. So, more. so the, just kind of sl slow it down a little bit here. Yeah. So, you were at YP, you saw the scoreboard and that ignited a fire on you. It's interesting what scoreboards do. It kind of bifurcates people. Either it lights you up and you want to, you want to win. You want to see the scores and you want to see the stack ranking. Other people don't, they don't want to see the, the, the score the scoreboard because yeah. they don't want to know. Right. And so I, uh, I think there's, uh, I've read somewhere that winners like the scoreboard because it, it uh, helps them to see what they need to go do next. And so then you were there, you had a, a boss that was smart and got out of your way and you let you do you, but then you weren't fulfilled. Sounds like yep. I've heard that before. And did you, did you start your agency while you were working in sales or did that happen after you left or what, what was that transition like? Yeah. So I 
had recently, before I quit my job, read the book Think and Grow Rich. This is when I started becoming very addicted. There's a point where I became addicted to personal <laughs> development, and then there's a point where I became very addicted to personal development. And when I left, when I was ready to leave my job, that's when I became very addicted. When I started in sales, I had read the book, but I wasn't like insane about it. And I reread the book, Think and Grow Rich. It talked about burning desire. It talked about burning the ships. So I told myself, I refuse to give myself a plan B. So I refused to start my business while I was under someone else's employee. It just, it didn't work with me. So I burned the ships. I just said, yep, I'm gonna all in. figure it out. And I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, make sales on my own. And here's what's ha what actually happened was it took me like eight months to make my first sale because I was so scared. I had this like irrational fear around accepting people's credit card payments. Like I just felt like that was the point of legitimacy. As soon as I accept their payment, I'm on the line. My LLC and my name are one. And I'm like, <laughs> if I ever get sued, I'm screwed. And just like I had all this irrational anxiety. And then eight months into me planning out the business, I had this huge grandiose <laughs> plan on how we were going to do a quarter billion dollars in, in 10 years and all the verticals that we were going to expand into. And I started modeling. I started looking at companies who had already done that. And I started, you know, this is before I started SMB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, find law and, and, uh, I looked at companies that were dominating other niches, like dental, yeah. really big dental agencies, really big construction agencies. I forget the name of some of these. Uh, Law three hundred and sixty yeah. or um, three hundred and sixty something was one. Of them. Mark marketing three hundred and sixty. Three hundred and sixty. I had this whole list of like 50 yeah, yeah. people to model, and that went into my strategic plan. And then I ran out of money. It was the best thing that ever happened. I ran out of money because I wasn't making sales for those eight months in my planning phase. The awesome right. thing was during that phase, I was able to, in, in the back of my mind, construct the early, the early formation of a rule book. And because I had that eight month runway from the money that I had saved, it gave me this extremely clear framework before I started the company that I am doing this for big reasons. I am not starting this agency to make some personal income and then stop at five employees. I'm making this agency to turn this into a multi vertical enterprise. My vision originally, which is why I think why you and I get along so well, it, you know, it's so funny. It was to create the best verticalized marketing agency ever created. Right. And I thought there, there was factors that would tie into retention with that and would allow us to cut through markets really fast by being a specialist in our marketing, because my goal was to go from zero to, you know, 256 million by 2026. And, and in order to hit that goal, I had to think of how are we going to cut through the marketing clutter really fast in our marketing? How are we going to cut through the clutter in product and, and also produce high retention and verticalization seemed like the best way to do that fast. Okay. Yeah. Why, why? So what about verticalization? signal to you that that would help you to achieve this goal of 256 million. Yeah. So I think when I was creating this whole plan, I realized that a company can only be as good as the quality of the niche it serves. And the niche that's being served has to fit with your core competency. So for example, if you're really good at e-commerce marketing, well, you probably shouldn't go into lawyer marketing. It's a completely different skill set. Now, if you're into e-commerce marketing, maybe you can take that skill set and apply it to doing marketing for auto dealerships because there's the complexity of the e-commerce of the car inventory. And so there would yeah. be more relatability there than lead gen, yeah. right? Right. Which, you want something adjacent versus sort of you know, opposite or different, very remote. Exactly. So my skill set yeah. was yeah. lead gen for local businesses. So I started looking through, into, through your, through your experience with YP. Exactly. Right. Yeah. right? So I felt yeah. like, okay, I need to find out what local businesses are the best ones to serve. And I started looking at non GDP correlated niches, right? Things mm -hmm. that would not dip sure. when a recession would hit. 
And the reason I looked into that is because my family went bankrupt in 2008 during the recession. So I, I had this huge scar tissue built up around, I refuse to let this marketing agency go under if a recession hits. Therefore, I better be smart with the niche that I choose. So I had a ton of anxiety. A lot. I was going to say, it sounds like a ton of pressure you put yourself oh, in. Oh yeah. Yeah. But as soon as I had gone through that thinking, it was clear to me that verticalization was going to be, it was going to require a lot of emotional discipline and it, but the payoff of that was from a marketing and a positioning standpoint, it was going to allow me to cut through the clutter a lot faster. That was really the main, main reason. And then yeah. the simplicity of the back end system. So I only had to train my team on the back end on how to do keyword research for these verticals of, of the business, right? Of, of one yeah. line of business. I didn't have sure. to train them on how to do 1500 different verticals. So operationally yeah. there is scale advantage and then positioning wise there's advantage. And what's interesting is all my first clients were contractors. So I thought it was gonna be a contractor company. Interesting. Yeah. So I went through like, you know, six months of thinking it was going to be that way. Through word of mouth, I actually signed up some attorney clients. My whole life would be different if I didn't get those clients through word of mouth. I mean, and yeah. when I looked at the results we were getting for people, we were actually getting more results for the contractors, cost per lead. It's just a lot less competitive, but they were getting a lower ROI. So I started thinking to myself, or why are we getting all these great results for our clients, but they're not getting a return from it? And the lawyer clients were getting half the leads and they were like super happy. I was like, yeah, something's up here. And I realized that the margin of the business that you serve is, is also really important. So yeah, that, and we just kind of stumbled in it. We had some, a ton of early success with our initial legal clients and that allowed us to sell the social proof of the last client. And then we went through the, the hard struggles that every agency owner goes through is, is finding your dominant marketing approach. I mean, it was like pulling teeth. It felt like for two and a half, three years, you know, we're running Google ads for ourselves. We're doing direct outreach. And it, we just, yeah. I remember the feeling I had, even though we were verticalized, Every single week when I ended the work week, I felt to myself, gosh, these, these attorneys probably just think I'm a little, you know, dweeb freaking agency, just like everyone else out there. Like I, we had no feeling of differentiation and it sucked. Even though we were verticalized, they were treating us like a cost competitive company. Like I'm, let me just compete. Let me just get a low cost from them. Cause I don't really trust them that much. It was yeah. just a bad feeling. Right. That more caused, transactional, more, more, more commoditized. Exactly. Right? We were being treated as commoditized. So I started thinking to myself, like, we got to differentiate ourselves somehow. And that's when I started learning content marketing and started doing YouTube videos. Now we have like over a thousand for just lawyers. With Andy, we probably have 3,000, you know. And we started content, we started lead magnets, we did our first webinar, and then the blessing of all blessings happened to our business model, COVID hit. And COVID was when we found ourselves Interesting. Out, of, out of being forced. We were forced to learn webinars. And it's why I always come back to like, what, what should a CEO do? What should an entrepreneur should do what you're excellent at? Stop pretending. When I did my first webinar, like, I felt like for the first time in my entrepreneurial journey, time stopped. I was just like, oh my God, I think something magical just happened, right? And I was just like, I need to do more of this. And my fourth webinar I had live, I had over 2,000 attorneys live. It was around 2,500 live, 3,777 attorneys signed up for my PPP for lawyers webinar on how to get PPP loans as a law firm owner when COVID dropped. Okay, so it was timely. I get that. So I'll I'll tell you, as the chief marketing officer of a of an agency in that space, we got nowhere near two thousand attorneys to our webinars. What 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 was different about your, your approach, the content, the offer? Yeah. Like what was the thing that made your your webinar so well attended? 
I wish it was all like some structured plan. Like at, but at, at that point in time, it was, it was partially luck. It was partially sure. just, but the reason we got that many people on, and this is a marketing principle that, you know, now with a, with a 11 person in-house marketing team, like we always try to come back to, but it's like the offer is the most important thing, right? So, so always it, 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 there's nothing higher value than the offer, right? And if the offer, and, and this applies to lead magnets, this applies to webinars, this applies to your actual core product, right? So the offer was right. Peep, uh, like think about this, PPP loans drop. It is actually like huge news for entrepreneurs, right? It was truly a period of People needed to be educated on this. It was the government is sending you hundreds of thousands of dollars for free that you can write off. What? I need to learn how to do this. And then boom, they see an ad from us and it's like, hey, PPP loans for lawyers. The day after it's Problem announced, solved. we're going to teach yeah. you exactly how to do it. So it just was timing, a little bit of yeah. luck and a home run offer that nobody else moved faster on. So we got all this market. Now, by the way, we had 60, 60, 60,000 attorneys attend our webinars through the rest of 2020, 60,000, right? <laughs> so we gosh. took that webinar <laughs> That's beautiful. and we turned it into a webinar yeah. series. And then that, that, and then I thought, okay, well, how do we get more registrants? Once PPP died down, oh, I got to go get speakers. And then I got my first yeah. speaker and then that turned into all the crazy speakers that we've had now. Magic Johnson, Kevin O'Leary, Damon John, Alex Rodriguez, all these crazy huge names. Yeah. But it all started from a process of doubling down on what worked and doubling down on what I actually felt that I was skilled at. So, so let's say, say more about that because I think not everyone is going to naturally be as good as you at webinars. So, because I think you, you have a, that it tends to align with your strengths. Yep. You have your, your, I know you as a great speaker, charismatic and, and you, you have great energy and, and uh, great communicator. So why is that important? Why is that? Why is finding the right channel for you? Yeah. Important. So, yeah. so important. It's one thing to say, like, for an example, we're going to dominate a vertical. It's another thing to find your way of dominating a vertical or dominating your niche, whatever it is. Yeah. So it's really, a, it's such a high quality question you just asked. And, and I, I think the, the easiest way to think about this is if you're modeling other people who were successful you have to filter it through your skills and what ignites you. For example, a lot of entrepreneurs that I've met who are successful are learners. When you're a learner, you study through reading, through modeling, through you know, modeling people who have been successful, mentors. When you are a learner, like most entrepreneurs are, you tend to adopt other people's successes, learn about them, and then naturally you experiment. So you go through a process yeah. of experimentation after you go through a process of learning. When you go through the process of experimentation, the market will always tell you whether your experiment succeeded or failed. The yeah. hard thing is listening to the feedback. So. I once read this book called Managing, no, not once read this book. I've read this book probably <laughs> 25 times. No joke. It's called Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. It's, it's a good book. It, I, I reread it anytime I'm lost because it reminds me managing oneself's number one ethos is to find your way of working. Find your way of working. Don't try to be someone else. So in this book, they talk about the concept feedback analysis. Feedback analysis is looking over your life in 18-month segments on average, looking at what the feedback shows. 
the feedback shows, okay, I did five, five things, five major things in the last 18 months. One of those five things created a disproportionate return. That's the 80-20 rule at work right there, right? Yeah. I did five things. One of these things got a disproportionate return for a low amount of time input, low amount of energy input. So in a state of full acceptance, this is why I've meditated every day for nine years, is because one of the hard things in entrepreneurship is seeing the obvious signs. Because entrepreneurs are so strong-willed and believe they can command things into existence, that can cause you to put effort behind the wrong thing rather than creating a frame of acceptance and going, hmm, right. market showed me this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, but this worked, so let's quadruple down on that. And then you got to find your version of quadrupling down on that, right? So an example is, yeah. do we want to put more ad spend behind this? Do we want to get a bigger speaker in my world for that? But there's other people who are more introverted and they'd be much better off doing written content to promote sure. their business. They'd be much, maybe yeah. if you're a networker, if you're like a super networker, I know a ton of, probably more successful entrepreneurs than are good on webinars, right? It's a weird skill. I A lot more successful entrepreneurs who are good at key strategic relationship building, right? Cool, go all in on that. I'm not that good at that. I'm, I'm kind of like a yeah. entertainer kind of, you know, <laughs> that's just who I am. So so then by extension is, is the advice that for, at least for an entrepreneur to try to not get focused on trying to be good at everything, but instead refocus that energy on finding the thing that you get out, like you said, outsized results relative to everything else you're doing. And you got to take massive action because the only way that this model works is if you're taking extreme levels of action fast. Say more about that. Like, what does that, what does that look like? So like you don't, success does not come from a board meeting. It doesn't come from a freaking strategy meeting, right? It comes from you doing the freaking thing at scale long enough to, to, see if it either worked or didn't work. So like one of my, this would be another role of, I, you know, my role in CEO is creating massive urgency behind things at the right time. So like massive action is, I think, I, I, I was messaging uh, Grant Cardone. He mentored me for like two years and I was messaging him the other day and I told him and actually promoted this in front of like 100,000 people at their event like last week. And I, I messaged him and I was like, dude, Grant, just want to let you know, man, the 10X rule is the only thing I've ever done that is truly full at face value, fully worked. Hmm. I've tried the, you know, uh, the uh, so 10X rule is basically 10X your goals to 10 times bigger than what you think they should be, and then do 10 times the actions that you think are necessary. Hmm. So if, so if you want to build a, a $1 million business, great. Set a goal to build a $10 million business. Then take the actions of what it would take to build a $10 million business. You're going to come up short on either goal. You're going to come up. If you set a million dollar goal, you're going to come up short. If you set a $10 million goal, you're going to come up short. The question is, which one do you want to come up short on? Right. Because if you come up short on 10, even if you get halfway there, you're at five. So I hardwired myself around 10x rule thinking, extremely big unreasonable goals. That's why our company has doubled and tripled revenues, you know, five years in a row is because I set those unreasonable goals and I tried so much stuff, so much right now, as soon as the freaking idea comes to mind, no board meeting, we're doing it right now, right? right. Yeah. We're, we're, mm. we're, we're going and we're going to operate with full conviction that this is going to work until the market tells us it doesn't work, right? So I just think so many entrepreneurs miss that. And it, it, I see so much guilt with a lot of the entrepreneurs I speak to around like, oh, I need to, you know, I can't, I can't set big goals like that, especially around money, God forbid, because it's not noble enough. I need to talk about my mission. And it's just like, bro, be transparent, man. Like if you provide more value to your market, you're going to make more revenue. 
right? Yeah. So our goal, yeah, it's, like we're going to have a $2.56 billion impact on the industries that we enter. And as a result of that, that market's going to pay us a 10% commission. And by 2026, we're going to deserve to be at 256 million, right? Because of the impact that we have. And then the actions that are like, you don't uh, want what you want. It's okay to I was want just what you say want. the same thing. Yeah. Yep. This is what Dan yep. Sullivan. Dan, 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 Dan Sullivan. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Want what you want. Yeah. Exactly. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. You're not fooling anyone. Yeah. Okay. So, so just kind of feed this back a little bit. So you, the, the focus on the 256 million by 2026 was, it sounds like a key driver for verticalizing because you knew that you had to get focused in order to go. And, and that was going to be part of your plan. The verticalization, it sounds like Is that generally true. Yep. And then you applied this 10 X thinking around having 10 X your goal and then 10 X your activity. Right. And, and that allowed you to just, you know, go full out with regard to finding ultimately that webinars and, and, and then ultimately live events more broadly was, was the thing that was unique to your strengths and also really the market responded to Yep. paraphrasing a little bit, but that's, that's, that's effectively it. I think that's all just amazing. So tell us about, you know, so one of the things that I've been impressed about your organization, I'm impressed by a lot of things, but one of the things was the fact that you guys are doing, you've really leaned into these events. Could you kind of share with the audience what the events uh, look like today? Like what, what is, how does it work? What does it look yeah. like? What are the attendees and all that? So here? another extension of doubling down, right? So what started as a webinar now has evolved into a three day virtual event where we, where we ran out a freaking Tony Robbins like studio with huge screens and hundreds of people yep. with their cameras on. It all came from doubling down, right? So, so okay. this, this is actually perfect chronological storyline, you know, going into this question. So now when you look at it, we've had events where we've had, you know, three day events. We ask people for six hours a day, three days straight. We've had events under this three day event model that we've sold over 4,000 tickets to. And we've had events where we've only sold like this 1,500 tickets to, right? What we've learned over time is that it's about the quality of the attendee, not the quantity. Can you say more about that? Like, what does that, what does that mean for your business? So yeah, we have three, three criteria for that growth minded revenue and practice area. So those are kind of the three things growth minded is most important because we found that the, the transformation services that we sell most times only relate to someone who sees a bigger future for themselves. But we've spent so much time and money on trying to get numbers for these events, all the big speakers and the return wasn't there when we would put that additional amount of effort to get mass numbers. But the return was there when we became more strategic with who we wanted to attend the events. Yeah. Right. So more, more of a, obviously you, you definitely want quantity, but qual a focus on quality in addition to quantity. Yep. And yeah. these events are like, it's insane. It's just, I don't even know how. So. I've been to one. Yeah. I, I've actually been to one. So I, I know what you mean, but it is for just listening audience. If you haven't seen any of the, the marketing for this, it is imagine the Tony Robbins, you know, how he, uh, if you're familiar, he is in the studio with professional, professional studio with the, the, the screens behind him and really, you know, taking the audience through what I would call a transformation itself and through a lot of content. That's, that's very, very, very much like what you guys have done. There's no, there's no yeah. competition for a transformation. So I, I love that you said that the event is to your point. Yeah. It's where we're bringing them through the first taste of a transformation. Right. So like, like there's no competition for this content. Like every, every other legal event is talking about boring PowerPoint presentations and like how to get better at bullshit. I just, oh my, like, it's just so painful, <laughs> painful to watch these legal events. Yeah. Like I would yeah. never attend a, a legal event in the, in its current form. So I was just dissatisfied with nobody's out here telling these, these, these precious business owners and attorneys, like there is more to your future. You can, you can build the law firm of your dreams. Like you can do this and here's how, and here's how you scale a firm. And we have proprietary processes on 
lawyer legacy staircase, the eight steps to get, getting to wealth multiplier and, and going through all these different stages of growth in the law firm. And that's the backbone of our coaching program, uh, the law firm growth yeah. acceleration model, all these frameworks that we've developed and it, there's no competition for it. And that's, yeah. again, you need to find your blue ocean strategy. You got to find the thing that nobody else can copy in your market. Hey, it's Corey. Almost every day I talk with agency owners who are frustrated with getting their outbound program off the ground. The truth is too many agencies are too dependent on inbounds and referrals to grow their business. We all know that it's getting harder and harder to generate inbounds and that it's just not a sustainable way to grow your business. I'd like to give you the six secrets for driving consistent ROI from your outbound that I learned as Scorpion's chief marketing officer, where we doubled the business from 20 million to 40 million just by adding outbound to an existing inbound only program. It's a free six day email course that will transform your outbound from broken to consistently driving new sales opportunities. You could sign up and get the first secret right now by going to get outboundroi.com that's get outboundroi.com now back to the show so for let's say a listener who is just starting out with trying to scale their agency and they want to use events as a channel they're drawn to that what advice would you have as they're getting started to get going and start to see some traction in the leveraging events to, to promote their agency Rule number one, don't do events. Okay. <laughs> number do two <laughs> is the only way that I will cross out rule number one is if you've done a hundred webinars. Okay. Say more. If you've done a hundred webinars, then you've gone through the motions. You've created your proprietary methodology and speaking points. If I had done an event before I had done a hundred live webinars, we wouldn't have the, we wouldn't have the brand that we built behind our events. I mean, when I did my first event, I wasn't like winging it. I was excellent at my presentations because I had already done it a hundred times. So the first yeah. time someone experienced our first event, the, I had, yeah, I, I had a ton of fear. Don't get me wrong. Doing, doing my first event, I had a lot of fear but when push came, came to shove, I had 100 reps to bank on. So I, what I would say to get clients is you got to practice webinars first. And, and in order to practice your first 100 webinars, you have to schedule your first webinar. And in order to schedule your first webinar, you have to, this is really, really complicated, so make sure you're taking notes. You have to pull out your calendar <laughs> and you have to put in your calendar when your webinar is going to be. That's step two. And then step three is you have to name the webinar. And then you have okay. to tell everyone you know about the webinar. And that's it. It's pretty simple. I, I imagine you want to, you also want to, based on your earlier comment around getting the first webinar, 2,000 people, super timely, very valuable information, hard to get, all those things. So coming up with the right content and the right hook offer also is what I'm gathering is also really important. Yeah. And like, it doesn't even have to be relevant. If you're building a brand, like, and you have no brand, you gotta do what you gotta do. Like if, if, you're, if your specialty is, you know, some niche of, you know, marketing in your vertical, like let's say it's, um, you're really, really good at creating header tags on website pages. Well, the last thing that you would want to title a webinar is how to create header tags to grow your auto dealership, right? right? That's stupid. No one's going to sign up for that event. So you have to take your skills and what you can deliver on. And more importantly, you have to make it appealing to your end audience. And what I did unconsciously in the beginning was I took a topic that had nothing to do with what I sold. And I, I made a promise. I delivered on the promise. And then the third step is the hardest one. I over delivered on the promise, right? So I, I, I promised you were going to learn everything you need to know about applying for a PPP loan for your firm. I found an expert that I interviewed. I didn't know anything about it. Found an expert who, not how, right? Found an expert, 
the expert taught them everything they needed to know, and then we over-delivered by allowing uh, this expert to help them apply like on his dime. So the, everyone's first experience with us was, oh my God, a company keeps their promise and they didn't sell me anything. And then repeat that after 50 webinars and the sentiment yeah. becomes, oh, wow, people are nice in this world and not all trying to sell me something. Right. You kind of have to, you have to be consistent to, to help break that belief. That's super helpful. Definitely for the listeners who are, who are trying to figure this out. How did, or what were the conditions that led you to evolve your services? It sounds like digital marketing was the primary focus initially. And then that grew into coaching. What, 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 what were the conditions that created that expansion of the scope of services you provide? So this, the coaching extended from me learning my gift for webinars, right? Why were, why were thousands of attorneys continually attending these webinars every single week? Well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not just a webinar presenter. Maybe I'm actually a great coach. And then that started making me think, you know, when this webinar series eventually ends at some point, am I going to just keep doing this for free or for the qualified people who are listening, do I want to help supercharge their success? They were clearly, my audience was clearly having problems running their firm. They didn't know anything about marketing. They felt victims to every marketing company they've dealt with in the past. And when I basically extended an offer and said, hey, for 1500 bucks a month, that was the price in the past. I'll teach you all the insider stuff about marketing that no one's ever told you, no agency's ever told you. And I'll help you manage your firm so that there's not so much chaos, right? and created a methodology behind this called the Grand Lawyer Marketing Plan. I actually started by selling a course, and then that course led to the coaching program. And the coaching program was literally me sharing my own lessons as I was going through my own entrepreneurial learning journey. And I had a ton of mentors yeah. that I was paying money for and coaches. So the coaching program became a way for me to just reflect on what was working for myself. And what's interesting is I, there were people who joined my coaching program at the time when I had seven employees. Now we have over a hundred employees. So there, there are people who have been with me from seven to over a hundred employees in my coaching program being coached by me <laughs> as I'm learning this on the go in real time. Sure. And that yeah. authenticity was ended up being one of the greatest selling points of the coaching program in, in the early stages was, listen, I haven't figured it all out. I'm pretty damn good at marketing though. And I'm going to figure out how to scale this big business. Do you want to come join me? Right. And dozens and dozens of people joined. And now, you know, almost 500 law firms are uh, being coached by us. So that's, that's awesome. So much goodness here. And then you obviously expanded the, 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 the business again into CFO, you know, fractional CFO services, yep. now virtual assistant, and then soon to be launched. You heard, heard it here first, recruiting. That's awesome. What other types of outside of your events, it seems like, let me back up for your events. What impact do the events have to the growth of your agency and services? Yeah, I think the events have the biggest impact from the goodwill that they create. So it's significant to give someone that much value in a world where everyone's asking for something. You know, if you think about how most people sell to professionals, it's download something and or book a call. And, yeah. and then you have some who do direct mail, which really is book a call, right? And so people are so accustomed to being asked, 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 and when you're a business owner, the biggest shift that these events have created is, and it actually became a core value of our company is give more than you capture. Like we want to give 10 X value in everything that we do. Right? So you and I've talked about this. Like, I don't want to send an expensive gift to someone if it doesn't provide intrinsic value to their life. Like, even if it'll book an appointment for them, it violates our core values. Like, 
Mm-hmm. We Everything that we touch, we want to provide 10x value and we want that to start in our brand. And that event is a way that we represent that. It's also a way that we represent how good we are at coaching because the event you're sure. getting coached, right? You have an experience of what it's like. Right. It's like, so, what? hey, do you and want then, more of this? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Join. Then, then how do they turn, tran, transition from being an attendee to your event, having a great experience into being a paying customer of SMB team? Once you've provided enough value to someone, we then, you know, at some point during the event, extend an offer, right? And the way that we extend the offer is, obviously we have it down to a science, so it's, it's not like we wing it. It's an extremely complex process, but what it basically does is we have a, a process of conveying the value of our offer and then taking people who otherwise would have thought about it or pushed off the decision and creating urgency behind them to make a decision right now. And you, know, you can do that by adding bonuses into the offer that get taken away if they don't make a decision. You know, so you gotta create, you gotta, the most important principle in how we sell it is that our offer is actually unique. You know, everyone, I, 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 again, I've, I've talked to so many entrepreneurs about this. I, I spoke in an event in front of 3,000 entrepreneurs on stage last year in Atlanta, and I could tell when I bring up the event stuff, everyone wants to know the secret. You know, how do you, how do you sell? And we've sold millions and millions and millions in ARR from these events. I mean, the average marketing agency does under a million dollars. You know, I think 90% or so do under a million. We create more revenue three times often, three times a million dollar agency four times a year for our quarterly events. So we create a $3 million agency every three months through our events, yeah. you know? So it's, it's a significant impact in terms of how much revenue we bring on. But the reason, again, it, it, it works is because our offer is actually different. If yeah. it was just, hey, buy marketing services from us, like that's what we've, we've put so much work into, if you think of like a Tesla product launch or an Apple product launch, most of the hype is in the excitement of the product, right? Yeah. That's what the entire meetup is. And if you're, if you're just a, if you're just competing on, well, we'll work harder than you and we have more experience than you, like, and you go do a freaking event, you can go build all the value in the world. You can go do the best content ever. And when you make the offer, everyone's gonna be like, yeah, dude, I can call 15 other agencies right after the thing. I don't need yeah. to buy your crap. <laughs> but if it's truly unique yeah. and people have that level of trust with you and you add some special things in it, like bonuses, it can be a really significant impact. So what I would urge everyone, you know, if you're listening right now, create a unique product because there, there's certainly too many mediocre ones out there. Let's talk a little bit about content outside of these live events. You and Andy, by the way, Andy is, you merged with Andy's company, Social Firestarter, I think in 2021. Is that yep. correct? And so he, tell us about who Andy is and, and the, sort of the, the events that led to that acquisition. Yeah, Andy is, I mean, the best marketer I've ever met, I guess is the best way to, to put it. And as I was scaling SMB, I have a habit of, you know, as a learner, whenever I notice that something, I'm missing a skill in some area, I I find the answer to it. I hunt down the person to teach me the thing, right? So I reached out to Andy to learn Facebook ads because he was crushing Facebook ads. And like a little dweeb with, you know, my seven employees, I'm like, hey, Andy, could you uh, spend some time with me? I'm a newcomer in the legal industry and da, da, da. And however I worded it, he accepted to meet with me. I ended up interviewing <laughs> him on my podcast, which really wasn't a podcast. It was just a YouTube interview. And that podcast interview turned into us doing a, I guess, you know, he wanted to learn some things for me when he heard how many people I got on my webinars. And that led to us meeting every, every Wednesday to do a mastermind. We called it the legal genius mastermind. 
I don't know why. And we actually had another very large agency owner in the space who attended those calls with us who eventually dropped off. And then it was just Andy and I. And through our communications, Andy was very transparent with me that he did not like managing the day-to-day of the business. He, he liked doing the creative stuff. And for me, I'm like a freaking... I love being CEO. Like I love bring on the responsibility, bring on the management, bring on all the complexity. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Like, bring it on. Let's that's go. Just, yeah, that's just exactly. in my DNA. So I told yeah. him like, bro, I will happily be CEO. Like yeah. let's find a way to make this work. Cause I was spending so much of my time in marketing that I thought, who could I yep. possibly trust to take this over? And then that's where, the, con- the, the conversation started. We did a couple of split events together where, where, we, where we kind of split our advertising efforts and started working with his team, realized how amazing his team was. And then in a matter of a very short time window, we, we decided we were going to go all in. And that came from client feedback. All of our product innovations came from client feedback. Clients complained because we were primarily doing PPC in the beginning. First year and a half, two years, we were only doing PPC for lawyers. That's it. Google ads. Yeah. Then we yeah. then we realized in order to keep clients for a really long time, we had to transition to full service. Andy provided social media and SEO and website. We didn't do that. So when we merged, we then were full service, which met our <laughs> the decision I'd already made that I wanted to go full service. So and then that evolved into coaching, and then that evolved into fractional CFO and virtual assistants. Virtual assistants yeah. came from clients complaining. I'm not answering all the leads you're already giving me. Great, let's solve it. Yeah. Fractional CFO came from no one's managing my finances. Great, let's solve it. Like one of our core values is extreme ownership. And the way we look at extreme ownership as a company is it's not our fault, but it is our problem. If a client is having a problem in managing their business, handling their intake or sales process, that's our problem. I take extreme ownership for our clients' problems. Therefore, I'm going to go out and innovate on their behalf. I'm going to go build the solution because if they had already solved their intake solution, they wouldn't need our VAs. If they had already solved their finance problems, they wouldn't need our fractional CFO, right? So obviously something didn't get solved. Therefore, it's my job to solve it. I think that's speaking to one of the... the the big and often unspoken benefits of taking a vertical market approach is that you can really become an expert in your client's world from, in this case, a marketing perspective. And all of a sudden you're able to see a lot of other sort of adjacent problems that are impacting their ability to be successful and that you're in a perfect position to be able to help resolve that. And think about this on on a market cap perspective, like the biggest agencies in legal have only gotten to 80 million in ARR, maybe a little bit higher in in some years. And think about, I know know we're going to get to 80 million in ARR, no doubt in my mind, in marketing. I think about adding coaching onto that. What's that? Another 50 market cap? And recruiting? That's probably over 100. And... Fractional CFO, that's probably a $20 million. So when we take all the stuff that we're doing, the VAs is, could be you know, multiple, multiple eight figures. When we combine all this together, we've taken our, our market cap per vertical to call it $300 million a vertical. So what I'm trying to figure out is how do we create a, a scalable vertical domination approach that each vertical does 300 million because then if i do three and a half verticals we're at a billion so that that's what i'm that that's what i'm gonna figure out so i believe you will so let's let's take a from a perspective of speaking to a agency owner an ambitious agency owner who maybe started off as a generalist and saying yes to everybody what what, what would you say are the positive aspects to taking a vertical approach to growing an agency? If you were to summarize those. Yeah, the positives are you cut through the marketplace noise faster and you create more stickiness because you're perceived as there to compete against 
one vertical for a specialty is a lot easier than competing against every company on planet Earth, right? Serving every vertical. And that is going to affect your retention. You know, so I think, and, and then also the scalability of processes, right? So your back end processes, you're able to, you're able to streamline, you're able to create in a service-based business, your processes are your differentiator on the back end of the business. So you need a unique process of doing multiple parts of to your marketing agency, your marketing. And those differentiated processes are going to be what makes you unique. And going into a niche, it allows you to create more d product differentiation through those processes as well. What are the negatives to verticalizing a business? Yeah, I think if you're really good at one thing, for example, e-commerce marketing, if you're just an e-commerce savant, right? You probably don't want to, you, you would be less inclined to verticalize. And the reason I say that is if you're, so you either have a technological skill that's super high or you have a niche skill that's super high. Mm -hmm. If you, if sure. you have such a high technical skill in some area, you don't really have to go niche because your technical expertise is niche enough, but you do need to go niche, maybe not verticalized niche, like yeah. industry vertical, but you do yeah, but need to go niche you to cut through the clutter in something. Yeah. 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 And your skill set and, and the thing you do, not necessarily who you do it for. Yeah. I, I kind of think of it like um like a like an etch a sketch you know these yep. things like the, the little the little kid toy where you can you can like figure out on the on the vertical axis it is who you're serving and the higher up you go the more specific you are and then the bottom axis is like you know the the thing you do and you can kind of play with the knobs to figure out like how specialized you want to be in the services you provide yep. and for who you who you provide those services for. Yep. And, it, and that's that's a it's an interesting uh, way to approach it. I just have one more question for you. We'll wrap it up. Cool. What's your motivation? So, I just got back from a two week sabbatical in in Hawaii, and I wish I could say it was like a super positive motivation, but I realized recently and accepted that it is very fear based. So my 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 primary motivation if I'm being completely honest with myself, is to not let what happened to my family in 2008 happen in my future. So this has been a quest of trying to figure out why my family went bankrupt, all the things that I can control in my future to make sure that never happens. And part of the mission is in the process of me creating a recession-proof business for myself, at scale, I want to coach everyone I talk to on how to do the same thing for themselves. So it's really tied into my personal mission around giving the universe all the tools I wish my family had when they were struggling running our family owned paving company. I wish it gets me emotional. Like I just wish, I wish so badly that my parents knew about all the books that I've read. I, I wish they understood how easy it is to scale a business and to create a, a differentiated marketing approach. And like, it's not as hard as building a rocket. You want to know what's hard? Read the new Elon Musk documentary or uh, biography by Walter Isaacson. You want to know what's hard? Nothing that you and I do is hard. Building yeah. the fourth rocket, <laughs> inventing the, the design of the electric car that never exists, like inventing the iPhone, that stuff's hard. Scaling a service business, yeah. like my, I just wish my dad knew that. I wish my dad had that level of understanding. And my mission is to, is, is to learn that for myself and then coach as many people as possible and, and, to allow my team to become a part of that mission as well. Yeah, I would say that's that's the big motivation. The enhancement motivation, like <laughs> the positive side of it, is yeah. I like winning. I like playing the game. Like I accepted that when I saw that leaderboard at yellowpages.com. 
like there's a part where I just can't help myself. Like, and, and I just recently had to realize that and on the sabbatical I was on, like, I just, I, I can't not do this stuff. I can't, I can't stop. I, it's just like, I just, I can't, <laughs> it, you know? So it's just. Gotta want what you want. Yeah. So. Gotta own it. But, that, yeah. but that's a significant that's why is like just loving the game is an important yeah. thing that like, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm thinking about the fear-based stuff all the time. Like most of the time I'm thinking about winning the game, but the fuel behind it is, is the, the fear. Well, I think the last hour and change has been an example of you living your mission of helping others. You've been very generous with your time and all of the insights that you've shared. So thank you so much, Bill, for doing this. Where would be a good place if people want to follow up with you, ask additional questions and you know, learn more about you or maybe SMB team? Where, what's, a good, what's a good way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, so I think the best place is you, my Instagram is BillHauserBiz. B I Z. And then our YouTube is where we put out the best content. So that's Bill Hauser as well. So that's the, that's the follow up with us personally. And then our, our company is SMB team. So if you are a law firm, then you definitely should go there. If you're not, if you're an entrepreneur, check out the personal, my personal brand stuff. Cause it's, we put a lot of effort into it. It's not law firm specific. My Instagram and YouTube is general entrepreneur content. So just looking to serve. Beautiful. Thanks, man. Appreciate you doing this. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm Corey Quinn, and I hope you join me again next time for the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast. If you receive value from the show, I would love a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.